Thus, the province of the jury and the province of the court are well-defined, and they do not overlap. This is one of the fundamental principles of our system of justice. Before proceeding further, it would be helpful if you understand how a trial is conducted. At the beginning of the trial, the attorneys will have an opportunity, if they wish, to make an opening statement. The opening statement gives the attorneys a chance to tell you what evidence they believe will be presented during the trial. What the lawyers say is not evidence, and you are not to consider it as such. Following the opening statements, witnesses will be called to testify under oath. They will be examined and cross-examined by the attorneys. Documents and other exhibits also may be produced as evidence. After the evidence has been presented, the attorneys will have the opportunity to make their final arguments. Following the arguments by the attorney, the court will instruct you on the law applicable to this case. After the instructions are given, you will then retire to consider your verdict. You should not form any definite or fixed opinions on the merits of this case until you have heard all the evidence, the arguments of the lawyers, and the instruction on the law by myself. Until that time, you should not discuss the case amongst yourselves. <coughs> I now instruct you not to communicate with anyone, including your fellow jurors, about this case. No communication includes no emailing, text messaging, tweeting, blogging, or any other form of communication. Cannot do any research about the case or look up any information about the case. If you become aware of any violation of any of these rules at all, please notify the deputy of any violation. During the course of the trial, the court may take recesses, and you will be permitted to separate and go about your own personal affairs. During these recesses, you may not discuss the case with anyone, nor permit anyone to say anything to you or in your presence about the case. If anyone attempts to say anything to you or in your presence about this case, tell him or her that you are on the jury trying the case and ask him or her to stop. If he or she persists, leave him or her at once and immediately report the matter to the deputy who will advise me. All cell phones, computers, tablets, or other types of electronic devices must be turned off while you are in the courtroom. Turned off means that your phones or other electronic devices is actually off and not in silent or vibrating mode. You may use these devices during recesses, but even then, you may not use your cell phone or electronic device to find out any information about the case or communicate with anyone about the case or the people involved in this case. Do not take photographs, video recording, or audio recordings of the proceedings or of your fellow jurors. After each recess, please double check to make sure your cell phones or electronic device is turned off. At the end of the case, while you are deliberating, you must not communicate with anyone outside of the jury room. You cannot have in the jury room any cell phones, computers, or other electronic devices. If someone needs to contact you in an emergency, the court can receive messages and deliver them for you without delay. A contact phone number will be provided for you. The case must be tried by you only on the evidence presented during the trial, in your presence, and in the presence of the defendant, the attorneys, and myself. Jurors must not conduct any investigation of their own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, using a computer, cell phones, the internet, any electronic devices, or any other means at all to get information related to this case or the people and places involved in this case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in this trial or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see any place discussed during the trial. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends or family members about the case or the people and places involved. So do not let even the closest family members make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. In this age of electronic communication, I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face to face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. What are all these reasons and rules for? 
These rules are imposed because jurors must decide the case without distraction and only on the evidence presented in the courtroom. If you investigate, research, or make inquiries on your own, the trial judge has no way to make sure that the information you obtain is proper for the case. The parties, likewise, have no opportunity to dispute or challenge the accuracy of what you find. That is contrary to our judicial system, which assures every party the right to ask questions about the challenge, the evidence being considered against it, and to present argument with respect to that evidence. Any independent investigation by a juror unfairly and improperly prevents the parties from having that opportunity, our judicial system promises. Any juror who violates these restrictions jeopardizes the fairness of these proceedings and a mistrial could result that would require the entire trial process to start over. A mistrial is a tremendous expense and an inconvenience to the parties, the court, and the taxpayers. If you violate these rules, you may be held in contempt of court and face sanctions such as serving jail time and paying a fine or both. In every criminal proceeding, a defendant has the absolute right to remain silent. At no time is it the duty of a defendant to prove his innocence. From the exercise of a defendant's right to remain silent, a jury is not permitted to draw any inference of guilt, and the fact that a defendant did not take the witness stand must not influence your verdict in any manner whatsoever. The attorneys are trained in the rules of evidence in trial procedure, and it is their duty to make all objections they feel are proper. When an objection is made, you should not speculate on the reasons why it is made, Likewise, when an objection is sustained or upheld by me, you must not speculate on what might have occurred had the objection not been sustained, nor what a witness might have said had he or she been permitted to answer. During the trial, it may be necessary to confer with the attorneys out of your hearing to discuss matters of law and other matters that require consideration by me alone. It is impossible to predict when such a conference may be required or how long it will last. When such conferences occur, they will be conducted so as to ensure as little of your time as necessary for a fair and orderly trial on this case. If you would like to take notes during the trial, you may... use. However, you should not take them from the courtroom when, and when we recess. During recesses, the court deputy will instruct you to place your notes face down on your seats. You will be able to pick them up when we reconvene. Of course, you will be able to take them with you when you deliberate. However, if you take notes, do not get so involved in note-taking that you become distracted from the proceedings. Your notes should only be used as aids to your memory. Whether or not you take notes, you should rely on your memory of the evidence and you should not be unduly influenced by the notes of other jurors. Notes are not entitled to any greater weight than each juror's memory of the evidence. Okay. It's important for you to also know that after the proceedings, your notes will be delivered to me. No one will ever read them, including myself, if you get destroyed. Okay? I put them in the shredder and they get transported. They are never read. During the trial, you will be permitted to ask questions of witnesses in this case. If you feel you missed something, you did not understand something, or if you need to clarify a pertinent issue. When the attorneys have finished asking their questions, please raise your hand to get my attention. I will give you time to write your questions on a clean piece of paper and give the paper to the deputy. I will then confer privately with the attorneys and after carefully considering your questions, if I ask your questions, the witness will answer the attorneys and the attorneys may follow up if they choose. The questioning of the witness is, primary, is the primary responsibility of the attorneys. If your questions are not asked, you must not discuss it with other jurors or hold it against either party. The rules of evidence apply regardless of whether a question is asked by the attorneys, by me, or by you. 
Therefore, there may be a legal reason why I will not ask your question. If I do not ask your question, you must not hold that against any of the parties. You must not discuss it with the other jurors, and please do not take it personally. You are not obligated to ask any questions, but if it will help your understanding of the case, you may do so. All right. So we may begin at this time. And state, are you ready to begin with opening statements? I need a moment. You need a moment? All right. All right. Thank you. Report. Counsel. Members of the jury. Today you're going to learn that on June 12th of this year, this defendant, Matthew Apperson, committed the crime of disorderly conduct. When he used profane language in front of an, of an eyewitness you're going to hear from today, and when he subsequently urinated on the porch and or door of a, of a Sherry Rivera. Good morning, my name is Matthew Futch, and today along with my co-counsel, Elena Vasquez, we represent the state of Florida. And as we discussed on Monday, we have the burden of proof, a burden to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant committed the crime charge, specifically the element or elements of the crime charge. And what are those elements? Well, today we have to prove to you one of the following. We have to prove to you that on June 12th, this defendant did commit an act or acts that were of a nature to corrupt the public morals, or that this defendant committed an act or acts that outraged the sense of public decency, or that this defendant committed an acts or acts <clears throat> that affected the peace and quiet of persons who witnessed those acts, or finally did engage in such conduct as to constitute a breach of the peace or disorderly conduct. Now you're going to get a copy of that instruction later um, that you can take back to determine whether or not we've proved that element or elements today here. How are we going to prove that to you? Well, first you're going to hear from Anthony Woods. You're going to learn that Anthony Woods is the uh, pool guy for the condominium complex that Sherry Rivera lives at, that he goes to this complex every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, as part of his duties of keeping the condo pool clean, chemicals right, all that. You're going to hear that on this particular Friday, he went there in the morning, and that like a lot of the Fridays, that sometimes the sprinkler system's on in the morning, and he has to come back later in the afternoon. So he came back later in the afternoon, and as he was walking up to his truck from the pool area, he heard the defendant screaming, fuck the police. You're going to hear that Mr. Woods, thinking that surely the defendant was talking to somebody behind him because he was so caught off guard, turned behind him and noticed that there was no one behind him. And as he turned back, you're going to learn that the defendant pointed at him and said, fuck you too. Subsequent to that, the defendant walked directly next to his condo. The condo of the defendant and the condo of Sherry Rivera are right next to each other, separated by a matter of feet. And you're going to learn it's at that time, in clear view of Anthony Woods, the defendant began urinating on her door and her porch. And it's at that time Anthony Woods got in his truck and left. You're going to learn that Mr. Woods tried to make contact with Ms. Rivera but was unable to, so he told the, an individual with the condo management company, I believe her name was Karen Payne, and he told her what he saw, and through the grapevine, Ms. Payne told Ms. Rivera, and Ms. Rivera ultimately called Winter Springs, or uh, called the police department. And you're going to hear from uh, Mr. Woods and Ms. Rivera. She's going to tell you that uh, law enforcement came out, Officer Rotano, who you're going to hear from today, uh, to take a report of the incident. He spoke with Ms. Rivera, who admittedly didn't witness any of this. And you're going to hear from Ms. Rivera that the relationship between her and her neighbors, specifically the defendant, uh, was not the best. And she hadn't spoken to him directly in several years. And she's going to be candid that she didn't see it that day. The only person that saw what occurred is Mr. Woods. But that she reported it to the police. Officer Rotunno is going to tell you that uh, Mr. Woods met with him at the Winter Springs Police Department, filled out a statement as to what he witnessed and what he observed, and ultimately that case was sent to our office. And here we are today. I'm going to ask you, at the conclusion of this trial, we're going to come back for closing arguments, where you're going to hear Mr. LaFay and myself uh, 
discuss with you what was shown to you here today. And it's at the conclusion of those closing arguments that you're going to retire to that jury room to deliberate. And I am going to ask you to return the only verdict supported by the facts, supported by the evidence, and supported by the law. And that is a verdict finding this defendant, Matthew Apperson, guilty of disorderly conduct. Thank you. in this case. That's it. One issue. Did it ever happen? That's the sum total of this case. Now, there's not going to be any evidence, physical evidence, whatsoever of any kind or nature that there was any kind of urine on this front door or porch. None. No stains, no puddle, no smell. You're going to hear that Mr. Woods is going to say that, you know what, this went on for 20 seconds. So make those ticks on any clock you like. That's a fair amount of human waste. Nothing. You're going to hear this urine he saw from 50 feet across the street right on the door. You're going to hear that that door is, in fact, a plexiglass door. It's two doors. Ms. Rivera has two doors. The first one, not a normal front door. But in front of it is a plexiglass door, as in glass. Nothing. Not a stain, not a mark. You're going to hear that there's all kinds of surveillance on Ms. Rivera's porch, all kinds of electronics. Nothing. She reviews it every three days. Nothing. You're going to hear from Mr. Woods, and you're going to hear he has a lot of issues. And I'm going to guarantee you one thing about the evidence in this case. I'll guarantee it. You haven't even heard it yet. You haven't, and by evidence, I'm talking about the testimony. You haven't even heard it yet. I will guarantee you that when I question Mr. Woods, he's going to start changing or things aren't going to be compatible with the rest of the evidence and the testimony in this case. He's not going to be able to say anything remotely constant or without contradicting himself. He's going to change his testimony. You're going to hear that there's one witness, Mr. Woods, with his issues that will come out in the trial. And this is a crowded residential street, not spaced apart houses, spacious yards, but a, a street full of condos. The chair walls, in short, densely populated.
Roughly how many pools are you responsible for, Mr. Woods? About 42. And that includes residences and condos? And residential and commercial. Does that include the commercial or condominiums located on Club Drive? Yes, it does. Okay. And how often do you clean the pool at the condos on Club Drive? Uh, three times a week or more if it's necessary. Okay, and that's within Seminole County, Florida? Yes, sir. Okay. And three times a week, what day specifically do you go to? Uh, that would be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about a specific Friday, Friday, June 12th of this year. Do you recall that day? Yes, I do. <clears throat> Did you go to the condos on Club Drive that day? Twice. Okay. Could you explain to the jury why? Uh, the first time, I got there very early in the morning, and uh, I could not do my job properly because it was still dark. Uh, I got there around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I vacuumed the pool and got it all nice and clean for the weekend, balanced all the chemicals out. Uh, that, that's my job, to make sure it's... It looks nice for everybody else when they go swimming on the weekend. Objection narrative. Sustained. Mr. Woods. I'm sorry. Did you, you're fine. Did you complete uh, your pool service at the pool? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Uh, what happened when you were walking back to your truck? I noticed there was a gentleman. Uh, cursing out the police. Uh, and, and Mr. Woods, I understand it may be a little uncomfortable, but what specifically did you hear this individual say? Uh, as I was walking out the gate of the pool, he was more or less saying, fuck the police, fuck everybody, and he's pointing his finger, and I just kept walking. I, I've never seen, I didn't know who the gentleman was. Uh, I started putting my pull pole and my net in my truck, and that's when he pointed at me and he Objection. said, Narrative. Uh, Mr. Woods, uh, after he, um, in your words, said, fuck the police, what did you do? Did you think he was talking to you at first? Well, first of all, I looked behind me and try. I thought somebody was behind me. I thought he might have been talking to them, and there was no one behind me at all, so I just kept walking. And, put my pull pole in the truck with my net, and uh, then he said, he started to point at me, and he said, oh, fuck you too. And Mr. Woods, uh, to this point, um, uh, or rather, let me rephrase that. What did you see occur after he pointed and directed that comment at you? Well, I, it seemed like he was quite agitated. Uh, and like I said, that's when I put my utensil, my pull pole and my net in a truck, and that's when he said, fuck you, too, okay, to me. Okay, what do next? Uh, then he, where uh, a gentleman lives, when he saw that, evidently he couldn't get a rise out of me because I, I didn't say anything back to him. beyond his competence as to what the, um, Mr. Apperson's mental processes were about getting a rise or not getting a rise. Objection beyond this witness's competence. I'll move on, Judge. Uh, what, what did he do specifically after that comment was directed at you? What did, what did he do? Then he went and urinated on the neighbor's door. Okay. Could you see specifically that he was urinating on the door next door? Yes, I could. Okay. Uh, did you see his genitals? Yes. Um, did you see him actually physically urinating? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, Mr. Woods, how old are you? I'm 63 years old. How long have you been cleaning pools? Too long? <laughs> no. <laughs> about, six, about six years, seven years. Okay. Um, had you seen anything like this before? No. Relevant. Can we approach your honor?
in all of your times cleaning pools, had you seen anything like this occur before? No, sir. Um, did this offend your sense of decency? Yes, it did. And that's irrelevant. <sighs> and, and your answer to that question, Mr. Woods? Uh, yes, it did. Do you see the individual uh, that made the statements you've testified to the jury um, and uh, physically urinated on his neighbor's door in the courtroom here today? Yes, it's Mr. Everson right, if you could right there at the defense table. Pardon me? You could identify him by an article of clothing and where he's sitting. Uh, he's got a blue shirt on. With, with, uh, a, he's in a suit and tie at the defense right. table. If the record could reflect, Your Honor, that the witness has identified the defendant, Mr. Apperson. Reflected. Prior to you seeing and hearing what you testified to, um, was the neighborhood quiet? Well, everything was quiet in front of me. Uh, behind me, the pool was full of kids. Um, so people were using the pool? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> I approach the witness, Your Honor. May I approach the witness? I'll be showing to Mr. Okay. Let the record reflect I'm showing defense counsel what's been marked as State's Exhibit A for identification, Composite A. May I approach okay. the witness? Mr. Woods, I'm showing you what's been marked as State's Composite Exhibit A for identification. Could you take a look at this, please? Mm hmm. Do you recognize those photographs? Yes, I do. Okay. What do those photographs show? Uh, this is the parking places that say visitor, where I always park my truck. This is the gate where I come out of. The house was, or the condo where Mr. Apperson was. It was directly across from there. I park on the second spot most of the time. Uh, this is uh, taken from the condo where uh, I, Sherry lives at, I guess, where Mr. Apperson peed on her door. And uh, this is a photograph from, you know, of the distance where I came from. Mr. Woods, are those photographs a uh, fair and accurate reflection of the vantage point that you had that day and the parking spot and the pool area where you were working at that? Yes, sir. With that, Your Honor, the state would move into evidence state's composite exhibit A for identification as state's composite exhibit one. No objection. You may. And push the question. You may. You should publish the jury. You may.
Mr. Woods, let me start with this picture here, the one that's facing the condominiums. Is that the vantage point that you would have? Yes, it is, sir. Does that picture show two doors by the dividing wall? Yes, it does. Okay. And if you could, for the record, which condo was the one that the defendant urinated on? Would it be the one on the right or the one on the left? The one on the left, sir. Okay. And he came out or, excuse me, when he was originally yelling in your direction, was he standing in front of the one on the right? Yes. Okay. Mr. Woods, was there any doubt in your mind that the defendant was urinating on that door or on the porch? Objection. Bolstering. You can answer the question. Was there any doubt in your mind that the defendant was urinating on the porch and or the door? None whatsoever. Okay. Approximately how long from the moment you first heard him yelling to when you finished witnessing him urinating on the porch, how long did that last? Oh, I'd say about three minutes. Okay. If that. And did you wait and see what he did after he urinated on the door or did you leave? Left. I was kind of disgusted. I'm sorry. Mr. Woods, who did you tell about this incident? Who did you tell? I told Karen Payne. She's the management company from Payne Anderson of the commercial pool I was cleaning. Okay. That's the pool that's back here. Is this someone you have interaction with as part of your job duties? Yes. Did you try to make contact with Ms. Rivera, the owner of the unit that was next door to Mr. Apperson's? No, I didn't. Okay. Were you able to make contact with her, I should say? Oh, yes, I was. Okay. And let me rephrase. That might have been a little confusing there, Mr. Woods. You made contact with Ms. Payne, correct? Correct. Were you ever able to tell prior to talking to Ms. Payne, Ms. Rivera, what you saw? No, I wasn't. Okay. What happened a couple of days, I believe it would have been six days later? Did you get a call? Yes. Who called you? Evidently, there were Karen Payne. She asked if I would go to the winter spring. Without saying, Mr. Woods, without saying what somebody told you, did you receive a call from Ms. Payne? Yes, I did. As a result of that phone call, did you go to the Winter Springs Police Department? Yes. And did you fill out a statement as to what you witnessed? Yes, I did. And you met with an officer, Rotunno? Yes, sir. Prior to June 12th, had you seen Mr. Apperson, the defendant, in the neighborhood before? I had seen him once, maybe twice, walking a dog. That's about it. Okay. But you didn't know him? I don't know him. Outside of seeing him in passing? That's all. And how about Ms. Rivera? Did you know her, or had you just seen her in passing? I'd seen her briefly, walking her dogs. That's about all. Kind of like a high-buy relationship? That's it. And that applied to both of them? Yes. The photograph you have, Mr. Woods, that shows the two parking spots, you park typically in one of those two? Yes, sir. And on that day, your testimony is you were in the second parking spot? Yeah, I was in the second parking spot. When you witnessed Mr. Apperson, the defendant, walk to his neighbor's condo? Yes. Did he walk the long way around the bush, or did he just walk straight over? I really couldn't see how he did it. All I know is he moved to one side and urinated on a door. It wasn't his door. Okay. Was it a straight? And also calls for speculation since the witness said he wasn't sure and doesn't know. I'm going to ask him a different question, Your Honor. Mr. Woods, how long did it take the defendant to get from the front doorstep on the right in that picture to the front doorstep on the left? Seconds. Seconds. Okay. Less than three seconds. Okay. One moment to confer. You may. 
I have nothing further for Mr. Woods. I'll tender the witness to defense counsel. May I approach the witness to return the exhibit to the court? May it please the court, counsel. Mr. Woods, you told us that you had been convicted of a felony. Yes, I did. Call your testimony. That was up in Philadelphia. Your Honor, can we approach? Pardon me?
So I think right now it's 1030. We've been going on for a little bit. I'm going to let you go back and get a little bit more coffee, get, fill up your waters, um, take a little stretch break. We'll bring you back. It should only be maybe five to ten minutes. Again, as I explained earlier, my estimation of time is usually never correct, but I try my best. So we'll go with five to ten minutes. If you just leave your notes face down, that would be perfect. Speaking on the record, could we approach them? Uh, May.
in your microphone. Yeah, you're fine. It picks up everything. Was that two questions? Your conviction, your conviction that you mentioned, was that in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, okay. And did you receive a prison sentence? Yes, I did. And how long was that? I received five years. If I could have one follow-up, Judge. Mr. Woods, roughly when, to your recollection, did you get out of prison? For the nearest year? In the 70s. The state would rest on its prior argument at the bench, Judge, as to the admissibility of that specific question. Okay. Your Honor, I would, I would, my, obviously, given the 30 years, I would now ask that one question in front of the jury. And, Judge, I think it goes without saying that if I desired to make an issue of remoteness, I could, and I think that under your discretion, under Florida law, you'd be able to exclude it altogether. However, he has answered truthfully. There are no judgment and sentences in the position of defense counsel, and that that question does, because the door hasn't been opened, does nothing but to further impeach the witness inappropriately. He's answered truthfully, and the statement that it was 30-plus years ago, I mean, this 2015, if it happened in 1975, that'd be 30 years ago that he got out. So there's been no, it happened in 1979, that'd be 26 years ago. So the statement of about 30 years ago would still be a truth and a remote issue relative to its admissibility to the jury. Your Honor, just to let the court know, I have now impeachment, and I would be proceeding by way of impeachment with regard to the 30-year statement, because my math doesn't make it 30 years. So I'm going to be, I would ask to, I would be impeaching on that. Meaning that it's 40 years? Well, I know Mr. Woods is here, he's listening to my anticipated cross-examination. I'm not going to, I don't want to telegraph it, but I'm just going to say there's significant impeachment at this point by my math. And again, that's on the basis of your analysis. Okay, again, I do believe the testimony that it was 30-plus years ago, more than 30 years ago. I do understand the argument made by counsel. Again, counsel does not have a certified judgment sentence. I allowed you to proffer based on the fact that state did say with that testimony and the other testimony that came in that he hasn't been in trouble since. So obviously the argument being that if he was in prison for a substantial amount of time, he wouldn't have the opportunity to be in trouble. But being granted the proffer and the questions and answers, I do believe that it does not have relevance. I don't think that it would be a proper impeachment at this time. So we will bring the jury back in as we discussed here at the bench. I will let you continue with the question as to it being in Philadelphia, but then I don't find that to be any harm in that question. So I will let you ask that question. And so we have a logical progression and flow, and then we'll move on from there. Thank you.
Mr. Lefay, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Woods, you told us that you were out at, I think it's called Cypress Club? Yes, sir. And you told us this was Friday morning the 12th, or Friday day the 12th, correct? Yes, it was probably in the afternoon. Okay. Do you recall making an earlier statement that this occurred on Saturday morning? Yes, I did. Okay. So, and in fact, you're not even sure what day it was, are you? No, I was not there on Saturday. I know I was there on Friday twice. That's not my question. I'm answering what you said. Your Honor, I'm sorry, Mr. Wood, I don't mean to get into an exchange with you. No problem. Let me re-ask my question. Okay. My question, you're not sure which day it was, are you? And that's a yes or a no, but if you'd like to explain your answer, Mr. Woods, you may. I would like to explain it. Then if you'd please answer my question, yes or no, and then explain as you'd like. Friday. So you are sure it was Friday? I'm positive. Do you recall having your deposition taken in this case? Yes, I do. And do you recall, let me see, that was on July the 17th? You're looking at the numbers, probably. That's a day I'd like to block out. The day that you had your deposition taken? Yes. Okay. And I understand, but, well, actually I don't, but my understanding is not relevant. I don't get paid if I don't work. So, Mr. Woods, let me ask you this. Do you recall being placed under oath to tell the truth on that day? Yes, I do. And you raised your hand, did you not? Yes, I did. And did you swear to tell the truth before your God? I did, to the best of my ability, yes. And specifically... Can we approach? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you recall, Mr. Woods, on page 6, line, and for counsel, line 18, the question. First, let me ask, do you, what date did this happen, or did you see it? What date did it happen, or what date did you see it? Answer, I'm not sure the date. I'm not even sure the day. Do you recall that testimony, sir? Yes, I do. Okay. And do you recall further saying on line 25, so I'm not really sure what day it was? Your Honor, I'm going to object this to the rule of completeness and have counsel read lines 20 through 25. Be fine. I'll be glad to do that, Your Honor. I don't have an objection. I'm supposed to be there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and a lot of times I'll go different days, you know, so I'm not really sure what day it was. Do you recall that, your answer? Yes, I said that. Okay. So here today, and I think just at about three minutes ago, or two minutes ago, you said that you were sure of the day suddenly. I was positive of that day because I had to fill out paperwork. 
Okay, well, let me ask you, Mr. Woods. Do you have the type of memory that just gets better as time goes on, where you remember things better, for example, today, uh, today being October the 20th, than you did on July the 17th? It's not, not October the 20th. It's October 21st. I'm unsure of the day. You got me. Thank you. No, it's my it's wife's October birthday. October the 21st. Day. Thank you. <laughs> I, remember, I remember the day okay. very clearly. But you didn't on July the 17th. Is that, is that your testimony? Yes, sir. Now, you on, you're telling us it was Friday the 12th. You didn't call the police that day, did you? No, I didn't. And you didn't call management that day, did you? No, sir. You had a cell phone and a Bluetooth in your truck, did you not? Yes, I did. And... Is it fair to say that you were basically across the street um, in the parking space that you've indicated, uh, the second parking space in that photo? Yes. Is that correct? Um, and then there's, of course, a yard, is that, and then the entrance to the two condos. Is that yeah. correct? Well, there's a street, then the yard. Okay. Seventy-five feet or so.